Let's take our Bibles tonight, and we'll get in and get to the Word of God. First Peter chapter 3, and I'm going to build on where we were this morning as we started. It wasn't intended to be a part one, but we didn't get as far as I was hoping we'd get through, but we got as far as God wanted us to get through, and that's always good that way. First Peter chapter 3, First Peter chapter 3, and we'll look at just two verses here, verse number 10 in verse number 11. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Let's all please stand tonight in honor and respect of uh, the Word of God today. Uh, we do have several folks who want to continue to pray for. Be sure to pray for Mrs. Martin. Uh, starts her um, treatment tomorrow. And uh, so she'll go in, praise the Lord, not for the, uh, the chemo, but she does have to do the radiation. So three weeks, hitting it hard, five, five days a week, right, Brother Martin? Uh, and so for three weeks, they're going to hit that good. And, and Lord willing, we're praying that uh, that'll take care of everything. And so she'll be good to go. And uh, that'll be a blessing. We're going to continue to pray for Brother Cornelison as uh, he's recuperated from uh, surgery that he had. And we've got other folks that are sick and not well. And we're still praying for Mrs. Usry and little Michael and all the uh, the folks in our church, and Brother Smith as well with his uh, shoulder and arm as well. First Peter chapter 3, verse number 10. The Bible says, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Uh, uh, Theron, can you get me? Is that one right here? Oh, perfect. Okay. That his tongue speak no guile. And uh, that says, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace. And ensue it, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and, and his ears are open unto their prayers. Thank you, Father, for tonight. We pray that you'd bless uh, our time together. Lord, help our hearts uh, to be knit together. Those that are here and maybe those tonight unable to be here, uh, but they're watching uh, through uh, live stream. And we pray that we would take these few moments with the Word of God that would really help us to learn uh, some vital truths that will help us to grow in our Christian life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. This morning's message was entitled, uh, Living and Loving the Good Life. Living and Loving uh, the Good Life. Uh, I made this statement this morning, getting saved does not mean that you will love life. Uh, the potential to love life is there and only there for a saved person. But just because you're saved doesn't mean you'll love life. And it doesn't guarantee uh, also that you won't have good days. It doesn't guarantee you'll have good days. Uh, we often think of um, a life that is loved or good days, life filled with good days, as a life that everything goes the way I want it. And everything is smooth sailing, life situation, life circumstances, all of our relationships, everything is just just, just pu pushing along just fine. And uh, no complications and no difficulties and no hardships uh, at all in life. Uh, but the question is not based upon, the good life is not based upon um, the results of what, what, we, uh, what we have or what we possess or what life situation and circumstances are, the good life, a life that's loved, is based upon what we do. It's based on what we do. Uh, and so it's based on me. And so if I'm loving life today, uh, and I pray that we are loving life and you're loving your life, uh, it's because you've chosen to do some things that allows you to love life and to enjoy some good days, some great days. If you're not enjoying life, if you're hating life, <clears throat> I'll tell you why you're hating life. Uh, it's because you're looking at your situation. Uh, you're looking at your uh, relationships. You're looking at your finances. Uh, you're looking at uh, you know things that are going on in your life. You don't like it, and you're saying, you know what? This is this is this is the pits. This is lousy. And these are anything but good days. These are really bad days. And I'm not loving life. And when I can get past this hurdle, then I'll love life. And and uh, when God will answer this prayer, then I'll love life. And when I can get through this hardship then I'll love life. Uh, no, God wants us to love life right now. It's a choice. It's a choice that we have to make. Uh, and so it's not based upon any of those things. Uh, Peter, in writing uh, to these believers here, and we won't take the time to uh, look at all the examples, but we looked at eight or ten verses in First Peter that talked about all the hardships and the trials and the adversities and the injustices and, and uh, times, hard times that we're going through. And in the midst of all that, Peter says, I want you to love life. 
I want you to enjoy good days. And so he tells us that it's not something that is based on what's going on on the outside. It's based on the choices that we make. Uh, we saw this story this morning of Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2.17 that had everything that the world says should be a, a, a life that's loved and a life that's blessed with days, uh, blessed days. And he says in chapter 2, verse 17, Solomon says in conclusion of his life, therefore I hated life. I hated life because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me. It's all his vanity and vexation. He had it all. He had it all. And in having it all that the world says, man, if you have this, man, you're going to love life. And if you live here, you're going to love life. And uh, if you could accomplish this, man, you're going to love life. If you could own this, man, you're gonna, if you're going to accumulate this, all these things, if you have it, you're going to love life. He had it all. And Solomon said, I hate life. I hate life. And uh, there's a lot of Christians, sad to say, that are hating life. And uh, you're just enduring this season of your life. You're just sort of biting the bullet and getting through this time of your life, hoping and waiting for that light in the tunnel to break through, to get through this hardship and try to remember the Bible says uh, God will not give us more than we can handle, more than we can bear, but we'll make a way of escape. That what? That we can bear it. Sometimes he escapes, uh, or we eliminates it to where we escape the problem. He removes the problem. Sometimes he strengthens us that we can bear up under the trial, that we can bear up under the burden, and we can bear the load, not because it's been removed, but because he strengthened us so it doesn't feel quite as burdensome as it did before we were strengthened in our faith. And so Solomon hated life. He had it all, but in having it all, he says, I hate life. And a few people uh, find good days, and few people uh, live a life of good days. I ask uh, the question of us to ask ourselves today, are you enjoying the journey of your life? Are you enjoying the journey of your life? And it doesn't matter what stage of life you're at. I mentioned the invitation. Uh, you know, if you're a, a, a single person, you ought to be enjoying life. It's a choice. Uh, if you're a young, a young married couple, you ought to be enjoying life. Uh, if you're a family with just little kids running around, you ought to be enjoying life and enjoying some good days. And you've got teenagers in your home. You ought to be enjoying life. And, and you're an empty nester. You ought to be enjoying life. And, and uh, uh, you're, uh, you're now a, a widow. You ought to be enjoying enjoying life. Uh, you're employed. You ought to be enjoying life. You're unemployed. You ought to be enjoying. You're retired. You ought to be enjoying life. God says it's not based on who you know or uh, where you're at in life or what you've accumulated. It's based on the choices you made to love life. And it's your choice if you're not loving it. It's nobody's fault but you. Now that's a good solution because, not a good problem because I can solve that. If I'm miserable because of the choices I'm making, because the Bible says in this verse here, he says, I want you to what? The Bible says, it says, for he that will love life. So that's a choice that you will to make. It's a decision you choose to will to do. He says if you choose to love life, you've got to do some things. But if you're not loving life, then that means that problem can be fixed by you. Nobody else can fix it. The problem may stay the same. Your life situation may stay the same. Your health may stay the same. Uh, your, uh, your, your finances may still be tight. And uh, your relationships may still be uh, uncertain. And uh, your, your home and everything may be a little bit unstable. And life's world and country we live in may not be stable. But in spite of all that, we can still have a life that God says, I'm loving life. I'm loving life. I would love to pastor Number one, be a pastor and pastor of people that just say, man, I'm loving life. Not because everything's going my way, because it's not. Not because everything's going your way, because it's not. Not because I have everything I want uh, and uh, I'm, uh, prayers have all been answered that I'm praying for. They haven't. Your prayers have not all been answered, but we can still, in spite of all that, God says, we can still have good days, blessed days, and we can have a life that's uh, an abundant, overflowing life that God desires for us. God wants us to love life and to see Good days. On our verse here, we began looking at the formula that God gives concerning how to have a life that's a, a life that you can love and a life that's filled with good days. The first thing we saw uh, this morning was we have to, and they're all ours that we're using sort of as our, our bullet points, but the first one was we must refrain from some things. 
we must refrain from some things. We see in verse number 10 of 1 Peter chapter 3, for he that will love life and see good days, now it begins to give us the formula, the ingredients that are necessary to have a life that's loved, to have a life that's filled with good days. God said, I want you to refrain your tongue from evil and your lips that they speak no vile. The word refrain means to take a break, to take a rest, to cease from what you're doing. It's a deliberate action. You can't passively refrain from doing something. It's a conscious choice. It's a decision that you made. And so God says, you want to have a, a, a great life? You want to have a blessed life? You want to have a life that you love living? You want to have a life where you see good days? Then number one, it all starts on what you talk about. Look what it says. It says you refrain your tongue from evil. That implies any ugly words, unkind words, uh, destructive words, harmful words that are spoken uh, with the intent to tear down and, and ruin and wreak havoc in someone's life. God says, let's not have an evil tongue. Then he says, I also want you to refrain from what? I also want you to refrain from having lips that speak guile. Uh, guile uh, is the word that implies trickery, manipulation. We talked about also the evil tongue uh, is a a gossiping tongue, a slandering tongue, a filthy speech, uh, a criticism of others, and a complaining and murmuring and griping. All those things, that's an evil tongue. And you will not, you cannot have a blessed life, a life you love, if you're always spewing out negative things. And as I said today, you're not going to speak those type of words if you're not thinking those type of words. That's why it's so important. Well, nobody, I never said it. Yeah, but you shouldn't even thought it. I can't control what crosses my mind, but I can't control if I dwell upon it, meditate upon it, and think upon it, and so can you. A lot of things cross our minds that try to discourage us. A lot of things cross our mind trying to, to, to defeat us. A lot of things cross our mind to try to distract us. But we don't have to think on those thoughts because if we think on those thoughts, it will eventually come out in our mouth, and God says you won't have a life that you love living if you're always speaking. Listen, listen to the way people talk. You'll know if they're loving life. If you're around people that are always complaining and always critical and always griping and always upset and, and always bellyaching and always uh, uh, gossiping and always uh, doing all these things, you get mark it down. They're not loving life. As much as they say, man, I'm loving life and this is great and, and I, I'm enjoying life, I wouldn't know it by listening to you. And God says that the key to having a life that you love is based upon what you say how you talk, and based upon what you think. And so tongue that is, is refraining itself from evil and, uh, and lips that won't speak uh, guile. Peter's words uh, help us understand the importance of our speech. Uh, and so many times I wonder how much of our life, uh, how many days of trouble we have that we wouldn't have to have, all because we said the wrong thing at the wrong time, we shouldn't have spoken it. And now our whole life, for that day, for that moment of time, is, has been ruined. So I said to love life and have good days. Uh, we need to refrain from some things. And then we, ended, we began on this thought. There's some things we must refuse. There's some things, refuse some things, if we're going to love life and uh, enjoy good days. I made a cross-reference. If you were not in here this morning, you can put in the margin of your Bible in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. In the margin there, you might want to put Psalm 34, verses 12 to 16. Psalm 24, verses 12 to 16. We looked at the reference this morning, but Peter was referencing that passage of Scripture in Psalm when he was talking about loving life and enjoying good days. Uh, and so David uh, could have uh, uh, made the choice to let his troubles guide his actions, but he rather chose not to allow evil to rule his life. He chose God. He says, you know what? I'm not going down that path. I'm going to think the right thoughts. I'm going to say the right words. I'm going to skew the, uh, some things. I'm going to refuse some things. And the things I'm going to refuse, the Bible says in verse 11, let him eschew eschew evil and do good. That word eschew uh, is an important word. Uh, we'll look at the, the definition in a moment. Uh, but uh, the very battle of good versus evil has been from the very beginning of the Garden of Eden. Good versus evil. Uh, good, which is focusing on God. Evil, that is opposed to God. All that's going on in our world today is good versus evil. Uh, it's not a, a political party versus another political party. It's not some uh, agenda or policy uh, or new law that's going to be passed uh, versus another policy or agenda or law. It's good 
versus evil. That's the battle that rages. It's always raised. It always will rage until the Lord comes back. And so it's always been there. And so evil uh, never makes a person uh, happy. It always uh, is against uh, God's will. Uh, if you choose to do evil, then you turn against God, and uh, you'll become an angry and a bitter person as a result of that. The word askew means, and we gave the definition in all this, but the word askew means to go out of the way or deliberately avoid using something. We must go out of the way. Uh, we must not be near or close to anything that would be evil, that would draw us in, the lurement of evil, the enticement of evil, the temptation of evil. The temptation is to get close to it, but not to cross over. God says you ought to skew it. Don't even get close to where evil is and uh, stay away far far away from it uh, indeed we must have an attitude that inclines uh, uh, not like the world that inclines itself towards evil but a child of God should have polar opposites that if we see evil we get away we get out of there we don't hang out there we don't associate with those folks there we don't allow our entertainment to be there we get out why we've got to skew evil why I want to have a life that I love a life with no regret a life with no heartaches, but I won't love life. I won't enjoy good days if I'm hanging around the evil crowd and hanging around the evil environment and hanging around evil. I've got to askew on purpose. I've got to stay away from the evil that's there uh, and uh, in our lives. And so the Bible tells us time and time again the importance of departing and getting away from evil. Uh, we look to this verse in Isaiah 5.20. Woe to them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And so the vast majority of television and, and uh, entertainment and movies and music, it promotes evil and it makes evil look good. God says you better stay and askew evil. Uh, well, it makes it look so good. And it makes it look so exciting, that kind of a lifestyle. And it makes it look so thrilling to live that kind of life. And sure it does. It appeals to the flesh. But God says you better stay on purpose far, far away from that askew, the evil. Uh, in fact, take your Bibles and go to 3 John. Go to 3 John chapter, or not chapter, but 3 John verse 11. 3 John verse 11. And uh, we look that uh, we, we make choices uh, of what we allow into our hearts and our minds. And evil can look very appealing. But we're only to follow God because only God is good. 3 John, and look what it says in verse number 11. Beloved, follow not that which is evil. You see, we're all followers. We're all following either something that's evil or something that's good. We're all following someone that's evil or someone that's good. So God, go read the verse now. Let's go to it again. 3 John 11, beloved, follow not. Don't follow that which is evil. But what? But that which is good. He that doeth good is of God. But he that doeth evil hath not seen God. So uh, we see the important God says you better find out the direction someone's going. And don't follow someone that, that, that's evil going in the wrong direction. Follow that which is good. Follow that which is right. Follow that which is righteous and pure and clean. And holy in the sight of God. Because we're all a byproduct of who we're following. The direction that we're going. Isaiah also called his people to put away evil from their lives. Isaiah 1 verse 16. Isaiah said wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before your eyes. Cease to do evil. What do you say? Put away the evil from where? From your eyes. You're looking at it. You're watching it and it's creating an appetite. You're becoming desensitized to it. To where you're going to eventually do what you're seeing. He says put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. That's in Isaiah uh, chapter 1 and verse number 16. And then it goes on to say, then uh, put away the, that which is going to cease to do evil. I will not do evil unless I see evil. And that's what the entertainment industry is trying to do. Uh, that's what uh, our peers are trying to do. Uh, that's what the billboards are trying to do. That's what entertainment is trying to do. That's what the amusements of the world are trying to do. They're trying to put before our eyes that which is evil, and, uh, and we call evil good, and good evil, and because it's an amusement, evil's no longer bad, because it's a, some uh, a video game, uh, it's no longer bad, it's good, and we put evil before our eyes, no wonder our country is going the direction it's going.
know him because we put all the evil in front of our eyes that causes us to do the evil things and the end result uh, of where we're ended up going. And so we've got to eschew the evil. We've got to avoid the evil, put away uh, that evil from uh, our lives. Uh, look, at uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 16, turn over there if you would, please. A lot of verses that we're looking at. Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, and uh, verse uh, number 17. Romans chapter 16, verse number 17. Uh, the Bible teaches again the words used uh, two other times, that word eschew. It's used two other times in a different format, but the same Greek word uh, is used. Uh, instead of having an attitude that inclines toward evil, as the world does, we're to have a, uh, an attitude or inclination or desire to, to get away from evil, to eschew evil, to avoid evil. The word's used two other times in the New Testament, that word uh, that goes to mean askew. But it's not used the word askew uh, in Romans chapter 16, 17. The Bible says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. That word avoid is the same word that's used for askew. It means to askew them. That means to on purpose go out of your way. Make sure you don't get close uh, to, uh, to being in a, in a situation uh, where you're in a you're to avoid them. So we're not only to eschew evil words and evil deeds, but we're also to eschew evil people. The Bible says, why? It says don't follow uh, a multitude. The Bible says to do evil. And so Job, the man of God, the Lord's servant, in Job 1, verse 1, and verse 8, in chapter 2 and verse 8, three times it says he eschewed evil. Job was a man uh, that God bragged on. And wouldn't you love to be a, a Christian that God would brag on and say, hey, look at that, that lady over there. She loves me, and, uh, and I can bless her. I love, she, he loves me, and, and I, I'm blessing him. And uh, why is that? Because he eschewed, she eschewed evil. Of course, in Job, he eschewed evil. That means what's the word eschewed? To on purpose, to make sure you deliberately go a different path. Uh, listen, uh, you know, if you see problems going on on a certain part of town, uh, it's wise to eschew evil. And it's not wise to, to be down at a place where they're rioting and uh, things are going all haywire. And so I'm just going to go down and check things out. Uh, yeah, that's how we get in a situation to where harm might come our way. We might get hurt. We might, that might be a situation that arises. We might lose our testimony. So what do we do? Eschew. Boy, on purpose, I'm, gonna, I'm driving a different way home if i got to go down this route where everything's a little bit haywire. And uh, I'm going to go a different uh, route. And uh, if things are going a different way or someone's coming out of a sidewalk uh, that doesn't look like it might be a, a proper individual as a young lady walking on the street and, and you might have to cross over and go down the other side of the sidewalk, you're eschewing evil because you see maybe the potential of harm and hurt that might come as a result of that. Job eschewed evil. He shunned it. He avoided it. He ran away from it in any form of evil. He got out of there. Psalm 97. Take your Bibles, turn there. Psalm 97, verse number 10. Uh, it's interesting. You might want to do some time a study. I mention that every now and again, but this would be a great study on the word evil. It's amazing how often that word is used in Scripture. Psalm 97, and to look in verse number 10. So Job, the Bible said, was a man of God. He eschewed evil. That's what caught God's attention. He didn't just walk the fence. He wasn't a borderline Christian. He wasn't someone that just had one foot in the world and one foot serving God. It was obvious you knew whose side he was on. It was obvious you knew who he was following. There was no gray area. You knew exactly who he belonged to. As a child of God, we need to make it clear to the world in which we live whose side we're on. Joshua said, choose you this day. Whom are you going to serve? But for me and my house, we're going to make it obvious what side of the fence you're on and let everybody know that uh, long before uh, they uh, see your actions your behavior they ought to see and identify with where you are in relation to the evil within this world Psalm 97 verse 10 look what the Bible says this is a powerful powerful verse you say preacher I love the Lord all right Psalm 97 10 ye that love the Lord hate evil I have a message I preached years ago. I may preach it in a different aspect uh, uh, in the upcoming months, but uh, your love life is determined by your hate life. You tell me what you hate, I'll tell you what you love. You say, oh, I thought as Christian we're not supposed to hate anything. 
uh, well, there's a lot of things that are opposed to righteousness and goodness and holiness that if you don't hate it, then you're not loving righteousness. You're not loving godliness. So the Bible says, ye that love the Lord, what are you to do? He says, I want you to hate evil. He preserveth the souls of his saints. He delivereth them out of the hand of the wicked. The measure of how much you and I love the Lord is measured by how much you and I hate evil. You say, I don't hate anything. Well, then you don't love the Lord very much. It was evil that nailed Jesus to the cross. It was uh, injustice, unfair, false accusation, lies. It wasn't true. I understand he died and suffered our sin dead in hell on that cross. And I understand the purpose and plan of God's uh, redemptive plan. I understand all that. But he hung on the cross, uh, falsely accused, lied about, unjust, well, unjust. And so God was there, there on the cross, all because of the reason of what? The purpose of his coming was it on the cross, even though it was unfair. It wasn't right. It wasn't something that was justifiable. But what did he do? He hated evil. He stood on the cross, nailed on the cross, and God the Father turned his back on his own son for those few hours on the darkness of the land. Proverbs 8, 13, look what it says. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord. You tell me how much you love God by how much you hate evil. You tell me how much you fear God by how much you hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. Proverbs 8, 13, the fear of the Lord. Got it? 8, 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate. Here's what you're to hate. Evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. God says, I hate this. Do you as a child of God hate those things? You ought to. God said, if you fear the Lord, you're going to hate evil. You're going to, and he references evil twice. He says you're going to hate evil, and you're going to hate pride. You're going to hate arrogancy, and you're even going to hate the evil way, the path that leads you to evil, to heartache, to disappointment. You're going to hate that path. But God says, do you have that hate? Do you have the fear of God, the love of God? Look in Zechariah. I'll give you a couple of minutes to get there. Let's go to Psalm first. You're, you're close to there. Let's do Psalm 119. Psalm 119, 104, and then... Um, let me, let me read that one for you. You get to Zechariah. Give you a little time to, to get there. Go to Zechariah chapter number 8. Zechariah chapter number 8. Let me read for us Psalm 119 verse 104. Write it down. You can look at it later. But Psalm 119, 104. Uh, so we saw uh, Psalm 97, 10. Ye that love the Lord hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of the Lord is a hate evil. Psalm 119, 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. When you find the truth, you're going to hate everything that's opposed to the truth. When you find the right path, you're going to hate everything that's opposed to the right path. He said, I hate every false way. You know what? There's a lot of false uh, plans of sal plan of salvations out there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, false ways that you're so you can get to heaven. God says you ought to hate every false way because every path that that person walks on, every false way, is leading to destruction. Hell, did you find it? Zechariah chapter eight, verse seventeen. Look what it says. This is another great verse. Let none of you, let none of you, you got a Zechariah eight seventeen. Let none of you notice these next two words. Imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Neighbor, you're not even supposed to imagine in your imagination something bad happening to your neighbor, something uh, wrong happening. You're not even to, to wish or to dream about it or to think about it. Uh, you're not even to imagine it. And what the Bible says, and love no false oath. For all these things, God says, that I hate, saith the Lord. God says, I hate it even when you think about and imagine and dream about harm and hurt and tragedy and heartaches uh, coming to someone's life uh, because you're imagining evil to someone. Well, I would never do that. But you're dreaming about it. You imagine it. You would like it to happen. God says, I hate that. Listen, you're not going to love life when you're allowing the, the evil to overcome you. You're not eschewing evil. You've got to stay away from evil. Evil talk, evil path, evil people because it's going to keep you from enjoying and living a life that is a life that's love. I said number one, refrain from some things. Number two, refuse some things. And then number three, we need to render, render some things. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. This is probably maybe the more difficult part of, uh, of this uh, formula to be able to enjoy a life that's loved and, and days that are blessed, uh, good days. First Peter 3, 11, the Bible says, let him eschew evil 
You notice the next three words, and do good. And do good. Refusing to speak evil is important. Shunning evil deeds is important, but both of those are not enough. Because I want to live a blessed life. This formula is in its entirety. You can't do one or two of them and have a blessed life. You have to do all of them. This is the formula for you to have a life that, man, I'm loving life. I'm loving life. Why? You're you're refraining from some things. And you're guarding your speech. And you're refusing some things. You're eschewing evil. And you're rendering some things. You're doing, the Bible says, doing good. We must also take the positive step of rendering good. Now, go back to Romans chapter 12. I want us to, to dissect this passage of Scripture a little bit because there, there is so much that is so relevant uh, to our lives um, in, in, in this culture today. Romans chapter 12. We've looked at this verse, but I want to look at the context of this verse uh, a little bit more uh, in its entirety. So it's good not to speak evil. It's good to avoid evil. But now God says you've got to, in addition to avoiding those things, You not need to do something. You need to do good. Look what it says. Romans chapter 12, verse 21. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Notice those two words, with good. Evil is out to overcome you. Uh, Let let me just say this. Evil, the word overcome means to, to chase, to pursue. Evil isn't concerned about the Christian that's inactive doing nothing for God. You're right where Satan wants you to be. You're, you're having no impact on the cause of Christ. Uh, no one knows you're a Christian. You're an undercover guy. So evil isn't going to pursue those of us that are, that are just a nominal, lukewarm, uh, inactive, uninvolved, non-participant Christian. We're right where God, we're right where Satan wants us. But the Bible says, be not overcome. That means that's talking about the Christian that's doing something for God. See, evil pursues those that are doing good, and the only thing that you can do to overcome evil is to continue doing good because it's the doing good that causes evil to catch your attention and or you to catch evil's attention. Evil chases those that do good, and you overcome the evil that chases you by continuing to do good. So if you're not doing good, evil won't chase you. So if evil's coming towards you, it's because it's trying to keep you from doing good. It's trying to overcome you with evil. Okay? Trying to hurt you, trying to trip you up, trying to mess up your life. Why? Because you're doing something for God. You're, you're impacting the cause of Christ. You're going somewhere for God. And so evil tries to overcome you. But then it goes on to say, I want you to overcome evil with good. Now I want you to notice the verse follows exhortations. This verse in verse number 21. Let's go back to verse number 14. Let's look at the context of, um, of all of this verse here in, in Romans chapter 12. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Notice the context we're looking at. So God says someone's persecuting you. Our natural response is respond in kind, right? Someone's mean to me, I'm going to be mean to them. Someone's unkind to me, I'm going to be unkind. Someone is rude to me, I'm going to be rude to them. Someone's did this, I'm going to do that. And so God says in verse, verse 14, he says I want you to bless them which persecute you. Don't curse them like you'd like, but bless them. Let's look at the other context. Go down to verse 17, same chapter. Recompense to no man. doesn't say whether it's saved or lost. It says no one, no man. Recompense, pay back to no man, evil for evil. Do not. You say, but he hurt me. That wasn't fair. That wasn't right. That was unjust. That was uncalled for. The tendency is what? To give them a little piece of their own medicine. To respond Uh, the way that you were treated. That's natural. That's what we want to do. Give them a piece of our mind. But God says, "Uh uh-uh, don't recompense, verse 17, don't recompense to anyone, no man, evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. And so he said, I don't want you to recompense. Now I want you to go down uh, and uh, look at um, um, the the verse that we're looking at now uh, in verse number uh, 21. The Bible says, uh, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. God's way always challenges our fleshly, natural tendencies. Always. Uh, For example, God always commands us to do what is very unnatural for us to do. 
Uh, it's unnatural for a husband to love his wife as he loves himself. As men, we're very self-focused. We're very selfish. Women are not in comparison to men. Uh, we're very, our, we are ego, self-driven. And so God commands men and says, husbands, love your wives. And then it says to the wives, what? Ladies, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. It's very unnatural for a man, a husband, to love his wife. It's very unnatural for a wife to submit to her husband. It also says to wives as well, love your husband as well. And so it's unnatural for us to get focused on someone else instead of ourselves. And that's a natural tendency. So when God says, don't render evil for evil, don't recompense evil for evil, I want you to do what's unnatural. I want you to do what uh, is against your nature. And it calls us to live to what? A higher level. There's often a term that we would use in our, our home, uh, which was we need to take the high road. The high road meant that we need to do what's the right thing to do, not what we want to do. We have to do what's the spiritual thing, not the natural thing. We've got to go the high road. We've got to go God's way. But that just doesn't seem right. And, and why do we always have to take the high road? Because someone has got to take the step of spirituality and step up and be the spiritual one. If not, the only other option is what? We become like the one who's hurt us. I'm going to let them know what, they, what I feel like by letting them know how I feel because I'm going to give it back to them. Now you stoop to their level and you're no better than them. And the very person that you are so mad at for how unkind they treated you and unjust they treated you, you've become just like them. If you've responded in this, that's why he says don't render, don't recompense, don't do back evil uh, to evil. And so according then to Romans verse 12, verse 21, we can only overcome evil with good. You see, God's goodness is always better than evil. See, if you focus on how good God is to you, you're going to allow that goodness focus on God to allow you not to focus on the hurt that was done you but on how good God is. You see, every problem is solved when you get your focus right. Your focus on the problem, it's going to be a problem. Your focus on the situation, it's going to be a problem. But when you get your focus on God, looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith, that we're going to make it through the journey of life and love life and see good days, we've got to get our eyes off the hardships, the injustices, the unkindness, the mean, harsh remarks. We've got to rise above that to a higher level and do good by trusting and looking to God's goodness. And when you look to God's goodness, we then become the recipient the conduit of God's goodness through us. How can someone do good to those that despitefully use you? Only if you're looking to how good God is. There's no way possible I'll ever be good to those of you that have despitefully treated me if I'm looking to you and I'm looking to my hurt and my pain. I'll never respond in goodness. But if I can get my eyes to the goodness of God, then God's goodness in spite of my hurt and, and, and uh, a pain, I can allow God's goodness to flow through me to you. And so when we overcome evil with good, it's not about you necessarily uh, working up an effort uh, of doing something good, uh, though we'll see that will be the end product. But it's first you've got to get your focus on how good God is. And when you focus on the goodness of God, now you can begin to do some good, allow God's goodness to flow through you. So there's only one way, one way that evil can be overcome a Christian, and that's if the Christian returns evil for evil. The only way evil can trip you up is if you respond the way that you've been treated. The only way. You've become. You've allowed the, the perpetrator and the one who's hurt you to become your role model. Isn't that good of you? You're allowing that person that did that to you to become your example that you're going to follow. That's a wonderful example because now you're following their lead. You're doing the same thing to them that they did to you. You're saying the same thing about them that they said about you. You're writing the same blogs about them that they wrote about you. Your social meeting about them, the same thing they criticize you. And you've become the, the follower of that role model, that example that none of us should have. But when we respond with evil... You only, overcome, you, over overcome, you only are overcome by evil 
when you allow the evil to cause you to respond in an evil way. The only way to overcome evil, the Bible says you must overcome evil with good. Now remember this scenario. Evil doesn't care about you unless you're doing good. You don't have evil's attention if you're not doing good, trying to serve God, trying to live for God, trying to have a good godly marriage, trying to raise a good godly home and family, and trying to live right and serve right and separate from the world, and trying to be a godly testimony at work, and trying to have good work ethic and being honest. All those things you're trying to do good. And so you've caught evil's attention, and evil's going to pursue you through situations, circumstances, people. It's going to pursue you to try to overcome you, tackle you. Take you down. And so you then turn back and you overcome and you trip up and tackle and destroy and overcome evil by continuing doing good. Isn't that what Sam Bell and Tobiah and uh, remember Nehemiah, they came and they says, hey, uh, come on down. Let's talk. Come on down. Oh, I got too much to do to come down and talk and waste my time discussing you. I've got a wall to build. And what he ended up doing at one time, he had a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. The sword was not to fight the battle. The sword was to keep him, to keep him building the wall and to keep doing what God had called him to do. God didn't call him to fight, but he would fight against anything that would keep him from doing good. And the battle that you rage and we rage today in our hearts is not a battle against a person or an individual or a circumstance or a situation. The battle we rage is to keep fighting so we can keep doing good. That's a fight. You're not going to cause me to stop doing good. You're not going to cause me to be evil to you. You can say what you want to say, but I'm not going to say uh, evil in response. You can do what you want to do, but I'm not going to respond in the same way. You can sarcastic, criticize whatever you want, but I will not respond. The battle is fought to keep doing good when evil tries to overcome us, and it happens all the time. From the beginning of time until God comes back, it's going to be good versus evil. And you've got to understand, if you're going to do good, you, ca you caught evil's attention. Now, what are you going to do with evil chasing you? You going to let it tackle you, or are you going to just keep on doing good and fight evil to the extent by doing good and uh, doing what's right? And so you overcome evil with good. If someone insults you and snarls at you, you're not overcome. You're an overcome. You over. You are overcome. If you begin to snarl back, then the unpleasant person has become your role model. You're copying evil, and evil's overcoming you. When God is saying these verses here, it, there's a right way and a wrong way to respond to hurts and injustices, and things are fair. You you can get angry, you can get back at the person that hurt you, or you can fight the way God fights. You can trust God to be the vindicator. You can give it to God. Let God take care of the vindicator. Let God take care of the person. Let God take care of the problem. And just keep on doing good. Or you get overcome and you start fighting the evil with evil. And guess what happened? You stop doing good. And evils accomplish what it wanted to accomplish. It prevents you to do good because now you're busy fighting the evil and, and trying to hurt that which has been done to you that's hurt you. Jesus is a perfect example of uh, overcoming evil with good. Look in 1 Peter. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and uh, verse number 23. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 20. Every heir of our life, our Savior, must be our example. And uh, in this example as well about uh, overcoming evil with Good. We have to be proactive, proactive, proactive in regards to um, overcoming uh, this uh, this evil and uh, and doing good uh, in regards to that. Look what it says. First Peter chapter two, verse twenty three. Who talking about Jesus when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But notice what Jesus did. But committed himself to him. That judgeth righteously. That's interesting. Jesus was the perfect man, 100% man, 100% God. He was, as it says here, uh, he was, he was um, reviled, but he didn't re respond. He didn't revile back. Uh, he suffered, but he didn't threaten. He said, I'm going to call down these angels. They're going to zap you, and we're going to wipe you guys all out. But what did Jesus do? He committed. He didn't commit the injustice to God to take care of it. He committed himself to God to take care of him so that he would not become evil. See, too many of us want what's been done to us to be done to that person. And we want to commit the problem to God and the injustice. And God says, God, go get him. Zap him. 
We sit back and just like waiting and watching for when God's going to send that lightning, you know, and everything explodes around uh, that area. But that's not what Jesus said. He didn't, he didn't commit the injustice. He didn't commit the unfairness. He didn't commit the hurt, the heartache. He committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. You know, there's only one that knows the whole story. Uh, there's only one that knows the entirety of the situation. And so Jesus says, I'm not going to fight back. I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to. In fact, when Jesus was questioned, what did he often do? He responded with a question. He didn't answer the question. He answered the question by asking a question. Whom do men say that I am? Who are you? Who, who, what are they saying? Who do they say I am? Why don't you tell me? And he responded that way, and so he committed himself. Concerning Jesus' earthly ministry, Acts 10, 38 says, he went about doing good. You see, overcoming evil with good ought to be a lifestyle because evil happens to us all the time if you're doing good. If you're trying to live right, evil is going to be on your tail all the time. You're going to have a target on your back with evil trying to overcome you. All right? Take that as a compliment and say, hey, I must be doing something right to stir up that. I must be doing something right uh, to please God because, boy, it's just one evil after another, one hurt after another, one heartache after another, and evil's pursuing you. But you're fighting off evil by doing good and trusting God and living for God. You overcome evil one way. That one way is by doing good. Keep doing what you've always done. It's doing good that caught evil's attention, and it's doing good continuing so that it'll overcome the evil in your life. Take your Bibles, go to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and uh, let me give you several verses here uh, where evil, overcoming evil with good, ought to be a lifestyle of every Christian because it's happening all the time. It can't just be a one-time occasionally uh, occasional occurrence that takes place in your life. You've got to be prepped and ready ready to be able to live the victorious life every day of your life in overcoming evil. Because when you're doing good and you're doing right, evil's going to chase you to tackle you and, to, and, to, and overcome you. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 16. The Bible says, look at the context now, rejoice evermore. Okay, there's, a, there's a formula God's giving us, another formula. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. That's preaching and counseling. Approve all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil and the very God of peace. Sanctify you wholly. Uh, what's the holy peace of God? It goes on to tell you, as I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. God wants to give you a whole peace, which was what? It's a triune peace. That's a peace for your body, for your soul, and for your spirit. This is an entire uh, formula that God gives us in regards to how to go about and uh, to do good. And so the list of instructions from the Apostle Paul is very relevant to us today. We need to rejoice in God. We need to bring our desires to God in prayer. We need to acknowledge uh, God's provision, be thankful, and keep all of these things. Do what? They keep your focus on God. Every one of these is an instruction to keep your focus on God. And then it goes on down, and what's, what's it say in verse 22? Then it says, abstain from all appearance of evil. You see, when your focus is right, that's why it says, and this is the will of God. In verse, the word says, give thanks uh, and for everything and, and everything. In everything, give thanks. It's unfair. It's not right. It, it's not, why did this happen? Uh, that's hurtful. That's unkind. That's harsh. God says, in everything, not when you get through it, not because everything's going good, but in the midst of the hardest times of your life, the most unfair times of your life, in the midst of those times, in everything, give thanks. Why? It's the will of God, not what you're going through, but to be thankful for what you're going through. Why would God allow this? God, God, why did God cause this? He did not cause it. God had allowed it. But the will of God is not what you're going through. The will of God is that you're thankful in the midst of what you're going through. And that says quench not the Spirit. Why? Because when you don't quench the Spirit, then you have now the Spirit of God to allow you to be victorious and to do good uh, in spite of the evil that's done uh, to you. As important as it is to avoid wrongdoing, that's only half the equation. We must also pay proper attention to the positive side. Askew evil. Askew a bad tongue. Evil tongue. Askew evil. Then he says do good. It's not just the avoidance of the negative. Now you have to proactively do something good. 
It's not just about, well, I'm not doing anything bad, but what are you doing that's good? I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't do this, I don't do that. Congratulations, but what are you doing that's good? It's not about what you're not doing that's bad. I'm not doing that anymore. Good, congratulations. But that's not the objective is to stop all the bad. It's to do good, to do something right. And, and that's what we see here. And so uh, the, the notion is only have so many of the mistaken notion that good is merely the absence of doing that which is wrong. Not necessarily, not so. Uh, one is good not merely because he doesn't do evil. One's good because he's actively working at doing good. That's why the Bible says it's you evil and what? It doesn't say be good. It says do good. Do good. There must be some active, proactive initiative on your part of doing good to those at work that have hurt you, those in your family that have hurt you, those in your relationships that have hurt you, uh, even God that you feel has let you down. God says you overcome evil with good, and you have to do good. You have to do good. You don't just think good. You have to do good. It's not just about being a good person because you don't do bad things. It's about doing good. It's not enough. Uh, look what it says in Psalm 37 in verse number 3. Turn over there, please. Psalm 37 in verse number 3. Uh, it's been said, and correctly so, the best defense is a good offense. The best defense is a good offense. Uh, you can have the best defense you, you, that you can have, but if you never score points, you're not going to win very many games. And uh, you can have a great pitcher, and he can pitch some great scoreless innings, but if your team never scores a run, no matter how good defensive they are, you're still not going to win very many games. And so we must have a good offense. We must do good. Got the verse there, Psalm 37, 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Hey, the only reason you're going to do good when, you, when evil's being forced against you is because you trust God. You trust God. You believe in God. You're relying on God. And you're trusting God. Motivates you to do good, not the evil that's been done towards you. So you overcome evil with doing good. You've got to do good. So shalt thou goes on to say, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. It's been said, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men, do nothing. And we're, we're seeing some of the repercussions of that in our country today. Uh, they say there's so many million Christians, but the millions of Christians don't recognize the importance of their vote and the values that God stands for, and they just sort of let, let fate uh, run, run the future. And now we allow good men that don't say anything, and evil will always prevail. Good must overcome evil. Uh, we don't become like evil. We must allow good to overcome. Uh, just don't think about doing good. Do good. Uh, too many Christians do nothing. They're standing idly by. They're just spectators. They sit on the sidelines. We've got to be active participants. If you want to have a life that you love life and you're enjoying some good days, then you've got to guard your speech from being evil. You've got to skew evil. And you've got to do good. God says if you're hating life, it's your fault. If you're loving life, it's your choice. You decide how much you love life by loving life and doing what God says. And it's not in what you have or where you live or what you know or who you know. It's based upon what you do. And it all starts with your tongue, avoiding evil, with your life, avoiding, eschewing evil, with you then choosing to be proactively doing good, and then, may I say lastly, reaching out for some things. Refrain from some things, refuse some things, render some things, and then reach out for some things. And we'll end up quickly get through this one. Number first, verse 11, 1 Peter 3, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Let him seek peace and ensue it. The word seek describes a fierce determination to have something or to become something. The tense that Peter uses here when he writes uh, the word uh, seek is a constant, arduous seeking to obtain something, not just an occasional attempt. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's just not one decision you make. It's a continual 
continual decision you're making. Seeking the lost is not just an occasional giving out a track. It's being proactively aware and focused and, and uh, determined uh, in regards to your uh, desire to seek the lost. And so as I come in contact with people all the time, they always want to be many times confrontational, uh, controversial. And God says, if you want to love life, you're not going to love life if you're always going to argue about everything. You always want to give your opinion about everything. Uh, you always want to, uh, you know, get, get uh, a push. Out. God says you've got to love. The Bible says here, you've got to seek peace. You've got to look for whatever you can to bring about peace. And the Bible says it says you must ensue it. There's always seems to be troublemakers in every home, every life, every family. God's chosen us, though, to be peacemakers. We must desire peace. We must ensue peace. So easily... Uh, we're ready to fight at the drop of a hat. We're ready to retaliate evil uh, when something is done. And God says, if you want to really love life, you've got to quit speaking evil, gossip, criticism, complain and murmur and all that kind of stuff. You've got to skew evil. Your life needs to stay on purpose. Get away as far away from evil as you can. You need to proactively do good. And then he says, lastly, you've got to seek peace and ensue it. Romans 12 says, if it, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. It says, if at all possible. Now, I understand sometimes it's impossible to live at peace with some, with some people because it does uh, allow, uh, uh, because some people just don't want to live at peace. And, and so I can have peace in my relationship towards you. You may not have peace towards me, but peace in my heart is not based upon us having peace with each other, it's based upon me having peace with you. I have no ill feelings. I have no animosity. I have no uh, anger, no resentment, no unforgiveness, uh, no critical spirit towards you. I'm at peace with you. Uh, if I see you walking through Walmart, I'm, I'm going to be glad to see you. Now, you may dodge and look, go down a different aisle and come out a different door, but I'm at peace with you. And that's the way it ought to be. We ought to seek peace, pursue, make sure that our hearts are right, that we're not retaliating with evil, not imagining evil in our hearts, our imagination. I hope they get what they deserve. I hope they get this. Listen, give, it, give yourself to God. Trust God with the results. Let God take care of it. And trust God how he takes care of it. Leave it in God's hands and just keep on doing good. Keep on doing good. And don't let the next evil that comes upon you to overcome you. And so live it all peacefully. You know, there's ways we can de-escalate things. And there's ways we can fuel the fire. You don't have to be married very long as a husband to know. There are certain things you can say to de-escalate the environment of the argument. Right, Brother Theo? Amen. Amen to this. And there's some things that you can fuel. Saying that you say, it's like, oh, my, why did I say that? And, and you fueled it. Or you can de-escalate it. How can we de-escalate it? Well, Colossians 4, 6 says, let your speech be always with grace. Let your speech. Colossians 4, 6. Let your speech be always with grace. There should never be a time that you say anything without grace. What's grace? Giving someone something they don't deserve. A kind word. That's a word of grace. They don't deserve a kind word. I know, but we must always speak words of grace. We're trying to be, we want to enjoy life. I want to love life. I want to enjoy good days. And God said, I'm going to enjoy good days. And I'm going to seek peace. How do you seek peace? I'm going to make sure my speech is always a grace. I'm going to say things that uh, grace is given to someone that they don't deserve. By grace, you're saved. God gives us heaven. I don't deserve heaven. Mercy is God not giving me what I do deserve. That's hell. But God said, I want your words to be seasoned always with grace. But I don't feel like saying it, but grace says it anyway. They don't deserve that kindness. They don't deserve that nice compliment. They don't deserve uh, that, that uh, response. God says, but do it with grace. And the verse goes on. Colossians 4, 6, let your speech be all with grace. Seasoned with salt. Seasoned with salt. Uh, and goes on that, you may, that ye may know how you ought to answer every man. There's a proper way to answer every individual that crosses your path how you ought to answer. Now, it may not be the way you want to answer, but if you're looking at grace and seasoned with salt, then God says, I'm going to give you the wisdom to answer this thing the way you ought to. Sometimes you don't have to always say what you're thinking. And sometimes you don't always have to say what you like to say. And sometimes it's okay to say 
what they don't deserve hearing from you to say, but it's being said because you're saying it with grace. I'm sure glad God does to me what grace can only bring to me. We're the recipients of grace. And God says, I want you to, I want to see how much you enjoy my grace, me giving you what you don't deserve. I'm going to see how much you enjoy that by allowing some injustices in your life, unkindness in your life. I want to see how gracious you are in allowing my grace to flow through you in the words that you speak to others that have hurt you. It's easy. It's not, it's not, words aren't gracious to someone that you love and that are kind to you and that that are nice to you and polite to you. That takes no grace to be nice in words to them. It takes grace to give nice words to someone who's not nice to you, who's someone that's rude to you, someone that's very uh, outspoken in a bad way uh, towards you with grace. I'm not talking about not standing for truth. I'm talking about getting along with people. And the, the Bible says here, we're to do what? Let him seek peace. And then it says what? Ensue. Yeah, that's an interesting word. The word ensue means to hunt, to chase, to pursue. It's a hunting term. It's used to illustrate a hunter who is committed to getting his trophy, that he goes out of the forest and begins to literally stalk an animal. He follows the tracks, the scent of the animal. He watches, he waits, he strategizes. And because of the hunter's careful planning and determined following of that animal, eventually he gets his aim. It's interesting that Peter would use this word ensue. When he talks about seeking peace, what's that mean? Peace doesn't come by accident. It doesn't just show up on your step because you wished it there. I wish we could get along. I wish I felt different about that person. No, you're going to have to actively ensue. Seek peace and ensue. The word used in Psalm, remember that cross reference we looked at that, that he references? He, uh, uh, that, uh, that Psalm uses the word pursue. Ensue here, pursue in the Old Testament. Same meaning, where they, a hunting term that goes after them. The word, it's a, a verb that means actively chasing after someone. Uh, or, or in this instance, peace. So peace uh, is not something that will just show up in your lives. You need to actively seek it out. Chase it. Follow it. Do whatever it takes to find peace. That's what the world's doing. Through yoga, they're seeking for peace. Through meditation, they're seeking for peace. Uh, through all these different little avenues that they're looking for uh, peace, they're looking for it. They're seeking for something, but true peace is only found in God. John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. So God says, I want you to love life. I want to love life. But God gives us a formula on how to love life. And I'm talking to some folks here tonight, you're saying, I'm hating life. I can't wait to get out of this season of my life and get, get something down the road that gets rid of all this. Um, listen, if you're going to do good, evil is going to pursue you the whole journey of your life. Get used to it. Get used to it. Okay, you're doing good. That catches evil's attention. Evil chases you to trip you up and ruin and wreck your life. But you just overcome evil by keeping on trusting God, keeping on doing good, and you just keep marching on. And guess what? Another evil steps in and chases after you. And you keep fighting those evils that chase you the same way you overcame the first evil and the second evil and the third evil that overcame your life. And so we have to recognize, I want to have a life, preacher, that, that I love. I want to love life. What do I have to do? It starts with your mouth. Nobody that's loving life talks the way you talk. Just listen how you talk. Listen how negative and critical and sarcastic and complain and gossip. Look at just let no you're not loving life. And so God said, you want to love life? Guard your tongue. Don't speak evil. Eschew evil. Get as far away on purpose from that which is evil and do good. Overcome evil with good. And then he says, seek peace and ensue it. Go after it like a hunter strategically is looking to have peace. And those Things in your life that are trying to rob you of your peace. Decide tonight, I'm going to have a life that I'm loving. You know what? I may have situations that I don't like, but that doesn't affect I'm loving life. I'm loving life. I'm not going to allow the evil that's being done to me to help me hate life. I'm going to just love life. I'm going to enjoy some good days. How come? Because I'm going to follow the formula 
that God, it's not a formula that the world says you find the life that you love. It's totally different, isn't it? It's based on stuff, things, uh, material uh, stuff, where you live, houses, clothes, cars. Get all this stuff. Solomon had it. And he said, I hate life. I hate life. And God says, here's how you love it. Here's how you enjoy good days. It all wraps around this thing called evil versus good. If you want to love life, you can't be hanging around evil. You can't be speaking and associating with evil. And you got to be doing good. you got to be looking, seeking, and pursuing, and ensuing peace. And God says, you're going to love this journey. Now, you still may be single, but you can love, love life. You may be in those twilight years of your life, but you can be loving life. You can be going through some physical hardships right now, infirmities, but you can be loving life. You can be a widow and loving life. Uh, you can be uh, unemployed right now and loving life. Uh, you can be with little kids in your home, loving life. It doesn't matter what stage of your life that you're in. You can love life. And what a great testimony of the goodness of God and your trust in God. You're saying, I'm loving life at this stage of my life. Whatsoever I have, I'm content therewith. I'm just loving life. And if you're not loving life, it's not what's going on in your life. It's the choices you're making in response to what's going on in your life. So if you're hating life, go ahead and be miserable all by yourself. But don't take everybody else along with you and make them miserable too. Because then we're going to have to make a choice to eschew evil. We're going to have to begin to distance ourselves from that which is causing us to not love life. And we don't want to have to do that. We don't want to have to live that way. We want to be able to love life together as we seek the goodness of God. Thank you, Father, for the truths of your word so clearly given, the outline, the formula that is vital, uh, Lord, to us loving life. I I don't imagine there's anyone here today say, I don't want to love life. I don't want to see good days. That's what everybody's searching for. Saved or lost, believer or unbeliever, we're all looking for a life that we love living. And, uh, Lord, too many of us are looking to our situation, our circumstances, our associations, our job title, uh, our bank account, uh, our uh, uh, you know, house and car, all that. We're looking at all these things to decide. Now I'm loving life. I finally have a cheat. I'm retired. I'm loving life. Oh, it doesn't matter where you are in life. You can still be loving life. It's a choice you make irregardless of the evil that you've had to receive, irregardless of the circumstances that are going on in your life, but it starts with your tongue not being evil, you avoiding evil, you pursuing good, going after good, and making sure that you're making, uh, seeking and ensuing like a hunter, peace in your life. And God says, you'll love life. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. Let's all stand. God has challenged us today. Simple truth, but very, very thought-provoking. The question really is, are you loving life? Are you loving life? Are you having a thrill of your time loving life? You say, preacher, how could I? Don't, do you see what's going on in my life? Do you see how unfair this is? Do you see how unjust this, how unkind? Do you, how, how can you say am I loving life? Look at my life. Oh, but look at all the examples in 1 Peter. Many verses we saw this morning, 8 or 9, that said, I know you're suffering unjustly. I know you're hurting unfairly. But you know what? I want you to love life. And here's how you're going to love life. It's unrelated to your situation. It's detached from your circumstances. It's all tied in the choices you make concerning your tongue, concerning eschewing evil, concerning doing good, concerning seeking and ensuing, pursuing peace. It's up to you. It's up to you. I can't control whether someone else does that towards me. But me loving life doesn't depend upon you doing it towards me. It's based upon me doing it towards you. I'm not going to allow the misery of one person to cause me to become miserable. I'm not going to allow the gloom and doom of one to cause me to become gloom and doom and not love life. Life doesn't revolve around that one person or that one situation or that one circumstance. There's much more to life than just that one event that has become all-consuming in your heart, in your life. God says, I want you to love life. If you're loving life, you're a great 
billboard, an advertisement to the lost that you come in contact with. Because no one loves life, or very few people love life. But when they see you loving life, knowing what you're going through, knowing the hardships you've got, and they see you having good days, it's like, man, there's something different about you. Yeah, you know what it is? We got to keep our focus on the goodness of God. When you see how good God is, then the goodness of God can flow through us so we can do good and overcome evil by doing good. Let's not be overcome by evil. Let's be overcomers. Thank you, Father, for the truth, the tenderness of these hearts. And Lord, I pray that you would help each of us. These are good Christians. Many watching at home, good Christians. And Father, they do have a target on their back because they're trying to do right. They're trying to live right. They're trying to serve you. And because they're doing good, They've caught evil's attention. And evil's raised up and reared up its head and is beginning a pursuit to overcome the one who's doing good. And so often we see casualties because they are overcome not because of the hurt and the heartache and the injustices. They're overcome when they respond in the evil way that is attacking them. The only way we can overcome evil is to continue doing good. And that always overcomes evil. It always overcomes evil. Lord, help us to focus on you and how good you are. In Jesus' name, amen.